The world is looking at the coronavirus, the COVID-19, and in every language and every part of the world, people are concerned with a virus, a plague, a pandemic. They are concerned with issues on the outside. And so they purify their bodies, they purify their homes, they isolate socially, they move around in the streets and avoid each other. What we want to look at and what is vital for our success is that inside there is also another spiritual plague, a spiritual pandemic, which is of critical importance for those who want a complete solution. When we come out of the pandemic, will we go back to what we are doing? Will the gambling places, the pubs, the brothels of prostitution continue and open back up? Will the interest prices go up? Will the rich continue to exploit the poor? What is important for us is not just the initial reaction to a sickness, but to look at why this sickness has hit us and how to really protect ourselves from the major sicknesses of our lives. And that sickness, as we have learned, especially as Muslims, because I believe that the Muslim Ummah has a key role to play. And that is the internal change. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, as we have learned in Surah Al-Rad, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيْرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيْرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. And so while we are looking for an external solution, we have to also study the internal issues. And that, inshallah, would take us to the issues that would bring about the real change that we need in our lives and in the world. And in looking at the in inside, we recognize that our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not speak from himself. And in an authentic tradition, the Prophet is reported to have said, in Allaha la yanduru ila adsamikum, wa la ila suwarikum, wa la kin yanduru ila kulubikum wa a'malikum. That verily Allah does not look at your bodies, nor your appearances, but he looks at your hearts and your deeds. So we see here that the term heart is being used, which of course is the inside. <clears throat> The Prophet, peace be upon him, also said at the end of a long tradition, That verily in the body, there is a lump of flesh, which if it is in good repair, all the body will be in good condition. And which if it is corrupt, the whole body will be corrupted. Truly, it is the heart. And so, we can see this word opening up and expanding. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, when asked by one of the companions about bir, about righteousness, he said, Istafti qalbak, ask your heart. When the companions would line up for salat, he would tell them, shoulder to shoulder, come close, so your hearts will not be divided. So if it was only the, the, the lump of flesh, it was only the physical thing, then how would shoulder to shoulder uh, be dividing up your hearts? How would a person ask guidance from something which is a mere physical organ? For more information on this, more understanding, we turn to the book of Allah in the 22nd chapter. Very interesting. There's many places in the Quran where the, the concept of qalb or qulub, the hearts, is being mentioned. This is a very, a very interesting ayah. Uh, in the 22nd chapter. And Allah is telling us, Afalam yasiru fil ard. Do they not travel through the land? Fatakuna lahum kulubun yaqiluna biha. So their hearts may thus learn wisdom. So now you get this concept of a person traveling through the land and their heart is going to gain wisdom. Now if the heart is only pumping flesh, then how can the heart be gaining wisdom when you're traveling through the, through the land? Then it continues, O Adhanun, yasma'una biha. 
and their ears may thus learn to hear. Now, you can see that you're traveling in the land and hearing different things and experiencing. So, of course, your hearing abilities are going to get better. You'll be able to, uh, to tune in you know, to the right issue and the right frequency. But then it ends in an amazing way, and it tells us, Truly, it is not their eyes that are blind, but is their hearts which are in the chests. So if the heart is just pumping flesh, how then can it be connected to gaining wisdom and knowledge? How then can, can the heart actually be given this quality of sight? Spiritual sight, of course, obviously. Because Allah is saying that it's not the eyes that are blind. So, so even the, the person may actually be physically blind, but it is the hearts which are in the chest. This is the key part of the body which needs to be uh, have basira. It needs to have the sight and the wisdom to continue on. So when we look at the heart and we are looking at the internal Muslim to find solutions to our ultimate problems of gaining the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's look physically at the heart. The heart has certain special qualities that we learned. Number one, your cardi cardiovascular system in that one of the first to form as the, the child is forming in the embryo, it's the heart. So this is one of the crucial parts of being a human. And the heart cells form and the heart, uh, it, it begins to pulsate. So they're literally moving. And this is unlike any other part of the body. So th there is a motion that is going on in the heart. It's like a life to itself. No other cells have this life force, not even the brain. So, so the heart then is literally pumping out life force to the rest of the body. The heart is 5,000 times stronger than the brain. This is a very important concept because we used to think that the brain was the key issue, that the mind is like the hard drive. It, it is the computer which is uh, helping the body to function, which is telling the heart what to do, telling the hands, the arms, everything. Your computer controls you know. The heart is 5,000 times stronger than the brain. We also learn that the heart actually governs the body, that the heart has a brain of its own, an organized network of nerves and plexi. Think about this that the heart itself has got a brain. So, so the heart literally is, is, a, is a life organ, pumping life, and it also has a type of intelligence. Because remember, there is IQ and there is EQ. IQ is your intelligence, your hard drive. EQ is your emotional intelligence. And so if a human being has lost the function of the brain, they're, they can still be alive because what's pumping the life is the heart. And we have learned from the scholars that the heart is literally the door to the soul. So the heart is still pumping. The soul is still alive within that body. And then uh, death comes about when the heart is giving up and then the soul leaves. So every cell in the body is permeated with life force from the heart. So it is that pumping of the heart, that is the engine that is really pushing the human being. And what is important now is that it's not just pumping the blood, like maybe the engine in a vehicle, but no, it has a brain. It is giving direction. It has wisdom. It has spiritual and physical sight. Another amazing, finding by the scientists is that the electromagnetic field of the heart has been measured uh, to be three to four feet from the body. So literally, um, there is a field surrounding us. And this type of light-based energy uh, is surrounding all individuals. And in a sense, emotions can affect the field. So somebody might come in your presence and you might feel uh, a type of fear 
and you're not sure why, it's just a human being, you look at the person, but you're feeling something negative. Th that is the energy, negative energy coming out of that individual to you. And people are in different levels of sensitivity as far as that uh, energy is concerned or knowing the energy. In the same way, we're in di we're different sense sense levels in terms of use using our brains. And so the brain was so important that the ancient Egyptians actually knew about the brain. And remember that Allah has sent prophets and messengers to all nations and all tribes. I was shocked when I found this information in ancient Egypt. It was that based upon my understanding from Islam, that the Prophet ﷺ said, in the a'malu bin niyat. Your deeds are based on your intentions and everybody will get what they intend. And he said that the place of your intention is the heart. Again, see, it's not just a physical thing pumping blood. You know what the, the ancient Egyptians said? They said that when a person dies, there is a type of judgment that is going on. This is an ancient sharia. This is knowledge coming from a prophet, showing them about the next life. And they said that uh, if the, the judgment, if the heart is in one part of the scale, and it's heavier than a feather in sin, then that person is going to suffer in the next life. So they're saying that you must have a clean heart when you are leaving this world. That's a very important concept. Remember it, that you must have a clean, sound heart when you are leaving the world. But the heart itself, as the scholars have shown us, and referring to the great scholars, Imam al-Ghazali, Rahimullah, uh, Sheikh Uthman Danfodio, Rahimullah, who was the great sheikh of the desert region of Africa, of northern Nigeria and the Sahara, and, and one of the great Maliki scholars in that part of the world. They looked at the heart. They looked at the internal person. And this is crucial for us because, again, this is the spiritual plague on the inside. This is what we need to look at. It's very vital in the same way that we're trying to understand all of the issues, all of the ways to remain pure and clean so the virus, which is a poison, this toxic vi virus doesn't enter into our body. Similarly, we need to, to, to look at what's happening inside of ourselves, so that the toxic virus, spiritual virus, does not come out of us. So this is a different concept now. But really, ultimately, especially for Muslims, this is the one which will make the difference. Because Allah said he will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. And so the scholars, and I found Sheikh Osman Danfodio, Rahimahullah, and his Kitab al tafriqa in, in one of the many books that he wrote, he spoke about Amrad al al-Qalb. What are the diseases of the heart? And, and the scholars would look at the heart at, you know, as this center, this spiritual center inside of, of every human being. And it, it has like a wall around it. It, it, it is protected um, by uh, certain qualities that the person picks up. And we learned about tawakkul, depending on Allah, and taqwa. And we learned about rida, being pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We learned about sabr. There are so many good qualities that we are learning, which will strengthen the person from the inside. But there are also diseases of the heart. And those diseases include, as we had understood, kibar, which is pride. And pride generally is dealing with something that is external. I'm proud of my color. I'm proud of my language. I'm proud of my uh, people, my passport. It's something on, you know, on the outside. And the great scholars showed us that we need to deal with this pride because if you don't, we will fall into the category of Iblis, the shaitan, who was so arrogant in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is cursed right straight to the day of judgment and would be punished in the next life. So pride is a dangerous quality. And I believe in looking at the Muslim world, this is one of the key issues that we will have to face as an ummah, as a nation as we go on. Because pride, when the person starts feeling that they're better than anybody else, it can lead to tribalism. My tribe is better than others. My race is better than others. 
And this is one of the big problems that we are facing. So in order to deal with this, there is a spiritual way to recognize that ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that controls life and death. And we start very simple as a simple uh, piece uh, of liquid and we go to a clot and we are very humble in the beginning and we will leave this world in a humble way and we will go back down into the ground in a humble way. So why are we proud? You can also fight pride in a, in a physical way by doing hard labor, by not being so proud of our physical self and proud about our reputations. Another one of the diseases of the heart, and these are all very important subjects that we need to look at in details, is this ghadab, is the, ang the anger emotions that come out. And when there's too much anger, then the person is in trouble. Because with too much anger, they lose control and they foam at the mouth and they strike and, and, and they hit. If you have too little emotions, you can also be in trouble. <clears throat> because Muslims will see their brothers and sisters suffering in the world and not feel any emotion. So what we need is i'tidal. We need a balanced uh, form of emotion inside of us. And the scholars have shown us if you're feeling this anger bubbling up, if you're standing up, sit down. If you're sitting down, lay down. If that doesn't work, pour water on yourself. So there's many different solutions to this problem. The third is hasad, and that is envy or jealousy. It's a terrible thing. Not that we would want something that somebody else has. If, if you want something that somebody has, that's okay. But when you hate the fact that they have it, that is the hasad. And the Prophet ﷺ said that the has hasad, it will burn up the good deeds of the person who has it. So it'll destroy the person who is hasid more than the mahsud. So the person who has it will get worse than the one that he's actually jealous of. The fourth one we want to look at in very uh, simple terminology, it's well known as riyah, and that is doing acts of worship uh, to be seen by people showing off in worship. This is a terrible thing. It's even classified as a, a minor form of shirk. The fifth one we want to look at tonight is urjub, and that is conceit. And that is a real disease of the heart. When the person feels that it's either my way or the highway, they are so conceited about themselves. They think that their opinion is the only right opinion or their way is the only right way. This is a sickness in the heart of the individual it can cloud up the decisions that they make. It can actually turn them from a, a humble, good person uh, into a really dangerous person uh, because of their narrow-mindedness and their stubbornness in dealing with other individuals. There is another category I wanted to enter into, and hopefully, inshallah, going through the works of the scholars and looking at our lives, we can return at some point and look at these diseases in details. And if you have any text that can take you to it, uh, then try to look at these diseases in detail. But there is something else which is extremely uh, important for us to understand. And the, the heart itself being shown as this beautiful uh, gem, which is inside of the individual, not just the physical heart, but the spiritual heart. Around this beautiful castle is a wall. And that wall is our protections of taqwa and tawakkal ala Allah and, and, and patience um, and ridha, being pleased with Allah, all these different good qualities that we have. But there is what is called madakhil iblis. There are entrances into the wall. Now, this is a deep study that was done. Shekhoth Mandan Fodio, you know, following Imam Ghazali and, and others, did a, an amazing study, madakhil iblis. What are the ways that the shaitan can come into our heart? Now, this is a person who was living uh, hundreds of years ago. Uh, it is a person living in the 14th century. and um, But it's amazing how the words that he is saying, how the scholars can maintain this prophetic tradition. And it is as though they're taking on that same prophetic knowledge that can talk to us, even though it is in the past. And so some of the issues here, I want you to think about these issues. Hopefully, inshallah, we can go into details uh, into some of these issues because it is really important. 
there are certain entrances that the shaitan has into our hearts. Number one, jealousy and covetousness, hirs. And this is when we are jealous, we learn it's also a disease. But it's so important to deal with this that he also considered it to be an entrance into the hearts. Because how much does jealousy affect us and, and, and have an impact upon our lives when we are dealing with each other? Another one of these madakhil is not only uncontrolled anger, but it is desires. So it's the desires that people have in this world. We have physical desires. We have emotional desires. It's like a hawa. And, and, and if we don't control our desires, then literally we can be trapped by them. And the desires will make more of a decision than our hearts and our minds. And that's why there's some dangerous posters that are being given to the younger generation. I remember even years ago and up until now, the Nike, you know, when they said, just do it. Just do it. And another one, they said, obey your thirst. Instead of saying, obey Allah, they're saying, obey your thirst. And then drink this Sprite or drink this Coca-Cola. So desires, when they're uncontrolled, and of course the anger, they're actually entrances into the heart. It's not just a disease, but it is an entrance which the shaitan or iyadu billah can come into the heart of the individuals. Another one is greed and ambition. And the greed, which is a tama, look at the world today. The richer are getting uh, smaller in number. It is, it is the greed for materials which is now making a major change. And, and, and we see the poor people and what is happening to them and a few individuals controlling billions and billions of dollars. This greed is, is taking over this whole world. But ambition is something to think about. It's one thing if we have the, the, the feeling to get up in the morning and to do work and to study and we have good, healthy ambition. But is that ambition when you continue to want to be better than your brother and sister and where you want to go to the top and you will do anything to be president. You will do anything to be the leader or, be, or, or to be the one who gets the prize. So when this ambition gets distorted, then this is an entrance, literally, that the shaitan will yadu billah can have to enter into our hearts and cause confusion. The fourth one is excessive love of food and drink. It's natural for us to love food and drink in the sense that this is our sustenance in this life, but excessive love, where the person doesn't just uh, eat, to live, he lives to eat. And there's a difference between it. And Shahra Ramadan coming to us close, inshallah, is the time when we should gain control over our desire, our love for food and drink. But for some people, and this is the cultural people, and this is where this year is going to be different because there's not going to be any major iftars. There's not going to be restaurants crowded you know, with people getting the most sumptuous foods. This time we need to be controlled and with our families. And so this will help us to regulate ourselves. And this is one of the beauties in the month of Ramadan, to give us that balance that we need. So when it goes out of control, this is literally where the devil can come into our hearts and destroy our lives. Another is haste. Now, look at these points. This is like he's talking to us. The sheikh said, haste, al-ajala, accepting necessary acts of worship. And the Prophet ﷺ actually said, al-ajala min shaitan that haste is from the devil. And so we need to think about issues before we jump into it. Young people, especially males, they want to get married, and they just rush into the marriage. They don't think about it. The young sister wants to get married, to the young brother or older. And then she says, I love him. He's got a nice curl in his hair. He's got beautiful eyes. But then the father steps in, the wali steps in, and he says to the brother, do you have a job? Because how are you going to be kawam? How are you going to provide? 
and, and that's critical. You need to think of all the different qualities. Is that individual suitable for the marriage? But the Sheikh Rahimahullah, he said, There's, there is one case where you can be in haste, and that is in worship, a necessary acts of worship. For instance, if you have a Zad wa Rahila, you have the ability to make Hajj, then make that Hajj. Don't wait until you're 50, 60, 70 years old. Make it when you are. If you hear the Adhan, if Salah comes in, make the Salah. The other point um, is wealth. And this is something, it's a very important issue. If wealth exceeds the basics, we need a certain amount of wealth to survive, to live comfortably in this world. There's nothing wrong with that. We need a certain amount uh, in order to protect us. But when it exceeds the basics, when we start hoarding wealth, hoarding, so we have so much more than we actually need to, to live a decent life in this world, then the, the wealth, al mal, can actually be a killer to us. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna li kulli umma fitna wa fitna to ummati al mal. Every nation has a trial and test. And the trial and test of my nation is wealth. And we can see it happening with some nations that have the, the strongest economies. They are more wealthy than any other people in the world per capita. And then there are other Muslim countries that are the poorest. This is a big test. But remember, when that wealth exceeds, it becomes a madkhal, an entrance for the evil one into our hearts. The next point is, and this is an interesting point, and I was shocked when I read this, of a person in the 14th century. He said, fanaticism in the madhab, the school of thought, and following whims. And what was happening is that there was uh, a book of aqidah in the Sahara region, and this uh, book of Aqidah was the Aqidah Sanusiya. It was done by the Sanusi uh, movement, and it was a book of uh, Islamic uh, beliefs. And people were taking this, and they were becoming fanatical with it. And they, they wouldn't accept other Muslims on, on their basic Islam. They start questioning their concept. Where is Allah? Uh, what is your concept of the hereafter? They would start questioning, even though the person might be humble and simple and need direction. And they would judge the person based upon their answer, and it caused extremism. We are facing the same today, where some of our scholars and young people, students of knowledge, are more involved in Jahwa Ta'adil. They are more involved in criticizing other people than they are in using their Islamic knowledge to better themselves and to better the world around them. So, ataasub, fanaticism, keep that in your mind. That can be an entrance of the shaitan into our hearts. And we see what fanaticism has done in our communities uh, over the last few years. Another one which comes out of this is hatred and contempt for those who disagree. This is like, it's talking to us directly. Because some Muslims will find that another uh, group of Muslims are 90 percent the same or 95. They basically pray the same. They believe in Allah, they fast in Ramadan, they give zakat, they go to Hajj. But because there is some slight difference in their philosophy or a slight difference in some of their movements in prayer or a slight difference in their orientation to Islam, the other group hates them and looks down upon them just because of the disagreement. And this is a major mistake because the companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had disagreements, but yet they were able to stay together as one saf, one line. The great ulama of Islam di disagreed with each other, but they still loved each other. It is reported that Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, the great imam uh, who gave one of the most beautiful schools of thought, he was traveling in Baghdad and he went to the masjid of Abu Hanifa, Rahimullah, the great Imam uh, of that area and one of the four great Imams. It was Fajr prayer. And normally the Shafi'is will do Dua Kunut uh, in Fajr. And they asked Imam al Shafi, naturally, can you lead Salat? So he led Salat and he did not read Dua Kunut. And afterwards, the people, especially the, the Shafi'i you know, followers, the extreme ones, 
They said, Imam, why didn't you read Dua Qanut? He said, because I respect Imam Abu Hanifa's position. I love him and I respect him. So I didn't do it. So in other words, they agreed to disagree. And sometimes there can be more than one solution to a problem. And that's really important for Muslims today, that even if we disagree with each other, we still maintain love in our hearts and we try to solve these problems, especially minor problems, so that they don't become major problems. And remember the madha, that the shaitan will not enter into our hearts. The next one, and again, this is um, an issue that happened in the desert, but it's the same thing happening to us today. Burdening the common people with pondering about the essence and descriptions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than necessary. And again, this is Aqidah. Going into the subject of, of Aqidah and burdening people with this. Literally burdening uh, uh, common people who are not studying books of Aqidah and books of philosophy. Why burden the common people? Teach the common people with love. This is important because when we start to do this, the shaitan will, billah, will enter into our hearts, will corrupt us, and will literally cause a confusion. Remember what the Prophet said, if your heart is corrupted, your whole body is corrupted. Everything that you do is corrupted. Remember what the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, that Allah is looking at our hearts. It is crucial. And Allah told us he will not change the condition of a people until they change which is in themselves. But I want to take you back to the understanding of the ancient Egyptians. And again, prophets came to all nations and all tribes. The last message is not the first one, but it is the khatam. It is the seal of all the messages. The last testament is here to supersede all the previous books. Last prophet Muhammad Wasallam has come with the guidance and the way and the sunnah to supersede all other prophets who came before. And so... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this final uh, book has, has shown us and um, it's very important and maybe before I do that I want to mention there's another point here which is really important as well and that is the, the last madkhal and that is holding suspicion against other Muslims to suspect other people that's a really important one so I don't want to skip over this suwadan that you will judge a person and I remember I would come walking along and they would they would look at me and say, uh, Asalaamu Alaikum brother, which country do you come from? Because they want to figure me out. What's your madhab? And the problem is for many of the new Muslims, uh, like myself, and that's many years ago, by the way, it's 1970, so that's a long time. But many people who are finding their Islam, they break out of these cultural ways that people have. And so in Medina and in Mecca and big gatherings, we could judge everybody by their clothing and their hats are the same. Every nation has got a uniform like a police or, or the military or the Navy or the firemen. And so a brother comes walking along with a Nigerian hat, with a Moroccan top, with Pakistani pants and Sudani shoes. He's getting the best of all worlds, right? And so they say, that's an American. That must be somebody from the West, right? They can't judge the person, so they don't know what to do. But actually, we should all be benefiting from each other's culture, and we should not suspect each other and, and to make judgments based upon uh, these issues. Prejudge is called prejudiced, prejudging a person. So this issue that the ancient Egyptians had, remember, and which is finalized in our Sharia, is that when you leave this world, you have to have a solid heart. Your conscience or this inside um, uh, beautiful vessel of the heart, which is not just a physical thing pumping, the blood, which is you know that spiritual side, that spiritual conscience of ourselves, the door to the soul. It's got to be sound when we're leaving the world. And Allah tells us very clearly in, in Surah Al-Shu'ara, verse 88, Allah tells us, Almighty Allah says, the day on which neither wealth 
nor children will be of benefit except he who comes to Allah with a sound heart. Free of evil, right? Qalbun salim. Remember it. So it's the beginning, your niyyah, places on the heart, it's the end. It's the inside. It is, it is the basis of whether we will gain the change from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is crucial for us. That when the month of Ramadan comes on us, inshallah, we take this, this time, do some studying of the great scholars. Look into the internal Muslim, not just the external. Because there may be some slight differences in the way we carry out Ramadan. There may be some slight differences because this is new for our community being stuck inside of our homes. We can't go out to the mosque. If there are differences between us, there should not be hatred in our heart. We should make our understanding clear, but our hearts need to stay clean. It needs to stay pure. This is crucial for us to come out of this month and gain the true change from Allah Azza wa Jalla. So I leave you with these thoughts, looking at Madakhil Iblis. What are the entrances? Shut the doors with all of these issues. Shut the doors with the diseases. Cure the heart. Cure it with taqwa, the consciousness of Allah. Cure the hearts with tawakkul ala Allah, depending upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Cure the hearts with patience, sabr, with rida, with, with having that real love of the creator of the heavens and the earth. Purify our hearts with these good qualities and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would accept us and would enable us to meet him with qalbun salim, with sound hearts. I pray that Allah would bless all of those in our listening audience and the Muslims that we leave this world with a sound heart and we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with sound hearts. I leave you with these thoughts and I ask Allah to have mercy on me and you. Wa and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.